The Broad Museum is right across the street from my daughter's music school, which made it easy to plan a family day around this assignment. The other day, my daughter asked me why people give each other flowers. I explained that they are something beautiful you give to people so they feel special. I imagine that in placement of Jeff Koons' metal oversized sculpture, some permanent collection curator thought it would make a suitable welcome image for their art heaven. I am taken by Kuhn's large balloon sculpture tulip. I think I'd gladly put a small version on a mantle or buy an inexpensive ironic gift for someone. Focusing on the kind of generic mass-produced objects associated with birthday parties, holidays, and other festive events, from a party hat and a piece of cake to Easter eggs and hearts. The celebration Paintings and sculptures reflect Kuhn's continuing engagement with the emblems of childhood. It takes me back to my childhood when you can pay a guy in a park a few bucks and he'd stretch and twist tiny air bulbs into some cool figure like a sword or a hat. Kuhn's found a way to preserve something as trivial as balloons, especially since everyone remembers watching a balloon go from its lively air-filled glory to a puppy with one deflated limb or no nose and finally a limp little piece of rubber on the living room floor. It's kind of like flowers. They're beautiful gifts. We can watch from bird's eye view as their life takes form and then diminishes right before our eyes. We can bask in their beauty when they are at full bloom or even enjoy the suspense and wonder of the possibilities before they bloom, but eventually it ends. We don't end, at least not at that moment. Maybe it gives us a sense of power to know we're not so powerless, but it doesn't take away the fact that there is an end. The next artist that drew my attention was John Ahern. As I walked past the museum partitions into a, what filled like a very white space, mostly because of the color and vibrance of a series of Relief sculptures literally popped out at you from the walls. The white plainness of the space suddenly feels much plainer against the snippets of colorful scenes. An older woman looks out of a window that looks like it would be on the front of a brick wall in New York City. A little boy takes a long stride with a churned head to face the viewer and a big playful grin on his face like he's up to something good. It feels like Coons has taken something that already existed in my head and presented it back to me, but on a pedestal. Einhorn has welcomed me into a world I'm not typically part of, the Bronx. He hasn't created the walls, scents, or textures of the sidewalk. Rather, he has created the people, and through them, I begin to form an idea. The thing is, I can walk into a room, and if there's a coat hanging on the wall or something like this for a moment out of the corner of my eye, my brain wonders if someone is there with me. I turn and realize it's an inanimate object, but the thought has crossed my mind and for a moment shaken me. In Ahern's Raymond and Toby, a black man is crouched down on what looks like a slab of asphalt next to his pit bull with a studded collar. His statue is placed at the center of the room unlike the reliefs that are on the wall. He belongs there, and so you get a feeling that by walking around him or off to the side, you are excusing yourself the same way you might do if you were crossing paths on the streets of New York on his turf. The difference here is I can crouch down too, I can stare at him in the face and take in his stare. Something about this man feels familiar. He is long and lean like me, and like me, sports a similar wardrobe, a hooded sweatshirt, and some slim pants. He has a dog. I have two. They're not power breeds, but nonetheless, I can comprehend this camaraderie between man and dog. I read that the sculpture was first placed in front of a police precinct in New York City, that it made people angry on multiple sides of the argument. Some criticized that the statues were made by a white man and questioned why a black person from the Bronx should be represented in this art form by him. People that work in the precinct thought that there should be some sort of memorial that celebrates law enforcement. Ahern has said about his work, making public work is the best relationship with the people that you're working with because you're doing something which is going to be shared by a larger community. Ahern considers his subjects to be disenfranchised. If people can see them in his art, in places like a police precinct, they might connect to the humanity of the very people they are policing. In an article about live casting, 
The process is described as claustrophobic. A subject lies with two straws in their nose as Aram places a white, gooey substance all over their face and bodies to create a cast. It's part of why, to him, they are part of the process. This is not just a work created by him. It's fully immersive for the subject. Therefore, they're part of the creation. Nonetheless, he is a white man choosing to create and win. Some of John's neighbors call him saintly, since they do not easily understand what a famous white artist, a downtown artist with a fancy gallery and a museum shows and critics at his door and a big retrospective catalog is doing living in a stripped down six floor slum apartment on one of the worst streets in New York City, hanging out with people like Raymond and Corey, and they suspect he has some sort of crazy penitential Christian purpose like Father Hennessy, his priest at a church of Christ the King around the corner. It is true that he has a choice and more options, but these are the faces and everyday occurrences that he wants to draw attention to. Even if they're from a privileged position, he has made the Bronx his community. There's something to say of the process that Ahern uses for his sculptures and his creative partner. He has worked with Rigoberto Torres, a Latin American from Puerto Rico. He has asked if a viewer could distinguish between each of their statues. Torres describes a distinct difference in how each approaches color and their styles of painting. Torres goes for color matching to the skin tones and accuracy, while Ahern washes and scrapes. Ahern has described his work as an informal Polaroid, wanting to capture poses and moments in people's experiences so it makes sense that he would not focus so much on the accuracy of their skin tone, but it makes me think about why a white man looking from the outside might focus on the experiences versus a Latin man, who is also not listed on the wall at the Broad, might work to attain the integrity of a subject's features. Perhaps the detail itself speaks to the diversity in race and ethnic perspectives and why some might feel the unfairness of seeing through Ahern's eyes instead of someone who has no choice in whether they live in a poor neighborhood or how they are received by law enforcement on face value. Even though we come from different neighborhoods and walks of life, I love that the idea that Raymond and I both love our dogs, wear hoodies, and are long and lean. This brings me comfort in a large ethereal space full of abstract paintings that I frankly get overwhelmed with otherwise. According to the article I read, Raymond was distressed for his pit bull who had died and the thought that it would live in bronze consoled him. It consoles me too and in this moment his humanity reminds me of mine and that's cool too.